Martial law, an extreme measure reserved for times of unprecedented crisis. It conjures images of military control, suspended rights, and widespread uncertainty. While it may seem like a scenario confined to the pages of a dystopian fiction novel, martial law has been declared in the United States multiple times throughout history, altering the fabric of society and reshaping the right of its citizens. Just picture this. A line of armored vehicles rolls down a quiet street, each one carrying armed soldiers donned with gear emblazoned with the insignia of FEMA. Residents watch in disbelief as these soldiers methodically go door to door, seizing supplies that were meticulously stored away for emergencies. Cans of food, bottles of water, and medical supplies vanish in an instant, leaving families feeling vulnerable and exposed. As tensions rise and questions mount, it becomes clear that martial law has been declared, and that the rights we've once taken for granted are now hanging by a threat. Join us as we delve into uncovering the truth behind martial law and revealing the keys to survival in its shadow. Now, the assumption is that the local government and law enforcement are incapable of handling the crisis, so the military is called upon to assume that role. Martial law can be declared by the president or by an act of Congress on a federal or national level using federal troops, and by the governor on a state level using National Guard as that state's military force. There is one law that limits the president's ability to declare martial law. It's called Posse Comitatus. In 1878, Congress passed the Posse Comitatus Act, which forbids the U.S. military involvement in domestic law enforcement without congressional approval. A significant clause in the application of martial law is the suspension of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is a right requiring the person under arrest to be brought before a judge or into a courtroom if they feel they've been unlawfully detained. Under martial law, a U.S. citizen may be detained with no explanation for why and no recourse through a typical court of law. Historically, martial law has been declared in the United States as a result of significant natural and man-made disasters, widespread rioting, or terrorism. To date, martial law has never been instituted as a result of a pandemic, but only time will tell. The fact of the matter is that societies around the world are quite fragile now due to economic stress, rising conflicts, and the constant potential for unexpected events. Under martial law, the Bill of Rights in the United States is essentially revoked. For as long as the Declaration is in place, now here are the basic rights that are no longer in place under martial law. The First Amendment, freedom of speech, assembly, and the press. The degree to which the First Amendment is affected under martial law is proportionate to the threat. A significant natural disaster has less effect on the First Amendment, and in fact, open communication through the press is encouraged to communicate status and steps taken to help people manage and survive the disaster. Civil unrest is another story altogether, and it's not just about newspapers and broadcast news. The internet and social media, blogs and web pages may find varying degrees of censorship and even suspension if it's felt that those platforms are being used to incite further unrest. The Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. It's quite possible that the confiscation of firearms could take place under martial law, especially if civil unrest is the root cause of the declaration. There are reports of this occurring in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. So it's always a possibility that those measures could be implemented if the use of firearms becomes a widespread threat during periods of rioting or looting. There's nothing that can be done about it under martial law. If the military chooses to confiscate weapons, they will. The Third Amendment, freedom from housing soldiers. This right goes back to the Revolutionary War when the British took homes and farms to house and feed their soldiers. It's unlikely that the U.S. military is going to come to your home and move in. Although in a worst case scenario, they may decide to put up a tent city on your property if you have a large enough tract of land. But even so, they would probably use public parks, school gyms, and large parking lots before setting up in your front yard. But under martial law, they could do that if they really wanted to. The Fourth Amendment, protection from unreasonable search and seizure. This is another unlikely event under most circumstances under martial law. It wasn't widespread following 9-11, although anyone who was suspected of being involved in the attack on the Twin Towers was subject to just that, and that's kind of the point. If you, for any reason, are connected to the event that has led to martial law, there's a pretty good chance that you may be subject to search and seizure without a warrant. Even something as simple as a traceable Facebook post could put you in that category. Life and liberty will also be highly monitored and restricted. Stop travel bans will often be in place in addition to enforce curfews and roadblocks to prevent travel to or from hot zones. 
If you feel that's a violation of your rights, it's because it is. That's the whole idea of martial law. In a dire emergency, the assumption is that the restriction of activity is for the greater good of the community, as interpreted by the local military authorities, not by you. But Posse Comitatus also prohibits federal troops from carrying out domestic law enforcement actions, such as searching and seizing property and dispersing crowds. National Guard units, as they operate under state rule, are exempt from the Posse Comitatus Act. And now that we know what martial law does and takes away from us, let's talk about how to prepare for it. First, you need to understand how martial law might actually affect you. Now, there are a variety of factors that would affect the degree into which your life and liberty may be affected by martial law. Are you a person of interest for any reason? If you are active in any group that might be associated with civil unrest or are known in your community as someone with a visible public presence for any movements or activities associated with unrest, you may find that the authorities are very interested in talking to you and assessing your intentions. Where this could lead is very hard to determine. Now, common sense dictates that you should moderate any activities that would cause you to stand out as a person of interest, and if questioned, to remain as calm and reasonable as possible. Are you essential to the functioning of your community? In the same way that some people find themselves subject to questioning and investigation, people performing essential services during an emergency or disaster are often granted exemptions from newly imposed rules or regulations affecting travel and curfews, or even the right to bear arms. Now, this could apply to healthcare professionals, local fire and emergency services, law enforcement, public officials, and business owners, and employees that are deemed essential, similar to what we've seen during the pandemic with pharmacies, grocers, and gas stations. If you feel you perform an essential function, you should inquire about identification or other ways to identify yourself and what exemptions from regulations are allowed. Now, this isn't about stocking up on toilet paper. When travel is restricted, you need to shelter in place. And that could require a supply of everyday items you need while martial law is in place. Fortunately, many people have some new experience with stocking up due to the trauma of 2020. We've all become fairly good, if not experts, at stockpiling food and medical supplies to a varying degree. But... Extreme events leading to martial law could result in some new, if not unexpected, challenges beyond food, water, and medicine. Power outages are always a possibility following natural disasters, but in extreme cases of civil unrest, terrorism, or economic collapse, power outages can occur just as frequently. Think about any power needs you may have and assess your ability to provide the basic power you need for your home to function. Now, it may seem extreme, but there are instances in some countries where even fundamental communications like the internet and cell phone service have either failed or been intentionally halted. So you need to think about who you need to communicate with, how you're going to communicate with them, and assess whether or not you can keep in touch when conventional communication fails for any reason. Do you have kids in college or living far from you? What about parents and grandparents? Is someone in a nursing home? These are the people that you want to communicate with on a regular basis to assess their condition and safety. Take the time to agree with critical family members about how and when you will stay in touch and what you can do if someone needs assistance. Now, if you have an established bug out location, you definitely want to consider relocating, especially if you live in an area where martial law may be enforced with greater severity. If you don't have a bug out location, you can inquire with family members and friends who live in a safer location and reside with them until the situation de-escalates. Regardless of where you travel, you want to make a move sooner rather than later. As stop travel restrictions and curfew are imposed, the ability to travel anywhere may be greatly limited or simply impossible. Situations resulting in martial law evolve and change with time. So do rules, regulations, and restrictions. Make sure you stay informed and communicate that information with immediate family and friends. A radio is a good, reliable option, and you can always sit in your car in the garage if you're wondering where to find a radio. It's quite possible that basic services like internet will still function, and there's always the TV, but in a power outage, your car radio may be your best bet. In other words, keep a low profile, stay home, don't break the law or any rules or restrictions like curfews, travel, or joining large gatherings that have led to any kind of trouble in the past.
You need to moderate your social media usage. Martial law is a bad time to get too public with hostile or antagonistic opinions. It's a good time to mind your own business, try to be polite, and just keep to yourself. Never brag about your preparedness. If you have enough food, medical supplies, and water to last a year, you need to keep that to yourself. If it's common knowledge that you have food stockpiled floor to ceiling in your garage and basement, you're gonna attract all sorts of unwanted attention that you don't need. If you own weapons, keep a lower profile. Don't be going out hunting, walking around with a hunting rifle with nervous military men expecting trouble is a bad time to hunt. If you own firearms for self-defense, don't stand out in your front yard holding a rifle to show everyone that you can defend yourself. Military training assumes the worst when confronted with anyone but with a weapon. Keep them locked up, hide them if you must. But remember that the name and address of the owner of any registered firearm is on file and easily accessible by local authorities. Now chances are they're not gonna be going house to house to confiscate guns unless gunfire in the streets becomes a common occurrence. It may seem like that's the time you would want a firearm more than any other, but the military approach to guns and gunfire is simple and quite fatal. Now, if you like this video, definitely hit that like button. Give us a subscribe right here and maybe even check this video out. I'm AP and until next time, I'm out of here.